Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word and turn in your scriptures to Genesis chapter 15. You'll find that on page 10 of your pew Bible, Genesis 15, reading just the first six verses, page 10 of your pew Bible. Let's give our attention then to God's Word. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we ask now that you would speak unto us most wonderful things in your word. Speak to us counsel, comfort, exhort us, rebuke us, instruct us as we have need that we might love you more and serve you more and obey you more. To your name be all the glory this day, almighty God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, whether you're here today as someone who has been in the faith for many, many years, whether you're someone who is relatively new to the faith, or you might not find yourself in the faith of Jesus Christ at all today. There is one fact about the Christian faith that is central and must be central to each one of us. Salvation is of the Lord. He is the principal actor in our salvation. It is his responsibility chiefly. It is his activity chiefly in the saving of sinners. And I would suggest to you there are few things more damaging to the Christian than to forget this truth. It is God and God alone who saves. It is God and God alone who justifies. And this text before us, Genesis 15, speaks to those realities in a very clear and eloquent fashion. It is the Lord who comes to Abraham to make covenant with him. It is the Lord who confirms his promises to Abraham. It is the Lord who provides proof of his promises to Abraham, and it is the Lord who justifies Abraham. And so this day, brethren, we are called in a sense, not really to be like Abraham, though he is an example unto us. But we are called chiefly to fix our eyes upon the Lord Yahweh, the God of the covenant, who has made precious promises not only to Abraham, but precious promises unto us. We are called to believe the substance of what God reveals about himself and his actions that this text speaks of. The substance is Christ, and the reward is Christ's righteousness. This is what is before us today. We pick up the narrative when God is confirming his covenant and promises once again to Abraham. In verse 1, God promises protection and reward to Abraham. God promises protection and reward to him. But in verse 2 and 3, we find Abraham questioning those promises. Uh, Abraham is seeking proof of God's promises. 
In verses 4 and 5, God provides a proof, the stars of the heaven. And in verse 6, God justifies Abraham. So let's look first of all then at God promising protection and reward to Abraham. First of all, as we read this text, and as we've read the text prior to, and that which comes after, we're going to see uh, the direction of the activity in the text, the direction of revelation, the direction of covenant, and that is a pointer to the direction of our salvation. Uh, that the direction of this text is from God to man, from God to Abraham. Notice in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. God's word came to Abraham. The subject of verses 1 to 6, indeed verse 7 also, we can see it very clearly, is again the Lord. Who he is, what he is going to do, and what he has done. Take verse 7, for example. I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to possess. When he reiterates the promises in verses 4 and 5, implicitly it's the Lord again who is going to bring these to pass. God is at work in this covenant and in these promises. And this, brethren, I think speaks to us of the directional issues of the Christian life. It is God who has acted to save. It is he who brings his word. It is he who makes covenant. He who promises. He who redeems. And that is very important for the Christian. In every aspect of our lives, our salvation, our sanctification, our justification, our perseverance in those hard and difficult times. Uh, brethren, while you are called to act, you are not the chief actor. You are not the principal actor. It is God himself who is doing a work. And Scripture says, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. And that's not about you. That's about God Almighty. So when God comes to Abraham now declaring marvelous things, promises, and covenant structures, uh, we see that it is God introducing these matters into the life of Abraham. And when God declares something, because he is God, it absolutely, no questions asked, must come to pass. What God says, he does without ever a single exception to that rule. And we also ought to say that in God making a covenant now with Abraham, he has also made a covenant with us. In fact, the very substance of this covenant is the very same substance of the covenant that is made in Christ's blood and in his flesh. The same promises given to Abraham, given also, dear Christian, to you. So as we are almost onlookers into this passage, it's almost like we can say we are standing there with Abraham, gazing up at the stars of the heavens, thinking how God has been faithful, not just to him, but to you, this day and forevermore. And the first thing he declares unto Abraham is this, fear not. When you read those words in the Old Covenant, it's usually... Uh, an introductory formula to what's called an oracle or a prophecy or revelation of salvation. Fear not introduces a salvific formula in the Old Covenant. What did Abraham have to fear? Well, first of all, the presence of God in the vision. It's enough to make any man fear. Uh, But materially, fear not the retribution of your enemies in the land that you are trying to settle. Fear not the loss of wealth that you just conceded righteously to the king of Sodom. Fear not as you seek to make your home in this promised land still populated with wicked and abominable people. Fear not, Abraham, that you have as yet no child of your own through whom all these promises will come. Fear not, says the Lord to Abraham and to us. Because he declares, I am your shield. I am your shield. We just sung that in Psalm 48, that the Lord has proven to be a shield under his people. It's the protection clause of God's covenant with his people. 
that when the world fights against Christians, they're really fighting against God and his almighty power. And God had proven to be a protector to Abraham already, a shield under him. He goes down into Egypt in some degree of sin and deceit, comes out a vindicated, wealthy man. While settling Canaan, God had been his shield. While fighting against the kings to rescue Lot, God had been his shield. He is saying, I will be your protector, not just now, but forever. And furthermore, he declares, your reward will be very great. Not just protection. Not just the land which itself was a picture of heaven. Not even the righteousness that is found here in verse 6. But God himself would be Abraham's reward. Because God in covenant is all about communicating himself and all the blessings that reside within God to God's people. Church father Ambrose in the 4th century wrote this of this passage. Because Abraham did not seek recompense from man, the king of Sodom, he received it from God. The Lord is not slow to reward. He is eager to promise and he gives in abundance, lest any delay cause weak souls to repent of having despised visible things. He pays back, so to speak, at high interest, rewarding with great abundance the one who has not been seduced by the things of the world that were offered to him. That's God, Ambrose's description of God here, paying back, rewarding to his faithful children at a high rate of interest, giving over and above what we could imagine. And brethren, we have to say this is the nature of the Abrahamic covenant. It's the nature of the covenant in which we stand now, the new covenant. <clears throat> Here we see God declaring his resolute purpose, his unshakable purpose to communicate ultimate blessing to Abraham and his seed after him, to communicate reward to a humanity lost and in peril and whose only present reward would have been the wages of sin, death. God says, I am providing another way other than the way of death and destruction, and it's the way of life in covenant with God. And we see this covenant is God-ordained, God-enacted. And the founding principles of this covenant with Abraham and with us are not the merits and the activity of man, but it is the love and the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. Notwithstanding what God demands of us in covenant, what obligations He puts upon His children, the founding principles of this covenant are His eternal love are his mercy and his grace unto sinners. So much so that not only would he reward Abraham materially, which he already has, not only would he provide him the land, not only would he provide him with a seed to inherit the land, but by the end of this section, Abraham is a possessor of the very righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. A staggering statement to be made about any sinner that they possess the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is the nature of the covenant, dear Christian, in which you find yourself the same promises, the same blessings, the same God, the same Christ who enacts it on God's behalf. It's the same covenant, at least in essence. So God says to you, regardless of what you are now facing, whatever complications in life, whatever terrors that life might be presenting you with at the moment, he says to you, first of all, fear not. Why? Because I am your shield. And your reward ultimately will be very great indeed. Even the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
And yet Abraham, as this passage progresses, verses 2 and 3, is just struggling a little bit. Let's be honest. He's struggling, uh, seeking proof of God's promises. We know that Abraham has faith already, because Hebrews tells us that it was by faith that he left Ur of the Chaldees. So he's a man of faith, now experiencing the doubts that accompany all our faith, the struggles of every one of us here today. And the issue peculiarly at hand for Abraham is this. He does not see the way in which God's promises will be fulfilled in his life. That's the issue at hand. <clears throat> he does not see the way in which God's promises will be fulfilled in his life. He surveys the land. It's full of pagans. Okay, he's already gained a victory over them. Perhaps he can, he can take the land. He looks at his age. He looks at his wife's age. And they're childless. How will this land be his? How will he have a great name? How will all the blessings of covenant in God come if he has no child? And with the eyes of flesh, he doubts to some degree the promises coming to pass. He says, O Lord God, verse 2, what will you give me for I continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Behold, you have given me no offspring, verse 3, and a member of my household, not a natural son, but a member of my household will be my heir. He does not see how God will fulfill the promises given his current circumstances. His faith is at this time a doubting faith. Now, dear friend, do not be discouraged if you feel that you also have a doubting faith. A doubting faith is not the absence of faith. In fact, it is the very presence of faith. Though it doubts, it is faith. A doubting faith is not an absence of faith. Our confession of faith assures us that assurance of faith is not of the essence of faith. That is to say, you can be a real, true, genuine Christian and still struggle with assurance issues. Sinclair Ferguson, Ferguson echoing our forefathers, says this, The weakest faith gets the same strong Christ as the strongest faith. Isn't that true? The weakest faith gets the same Christ as the strongest faith. And Abraham's faith here is one which is questioning, seeking, seeking something from God as an assurance that the promises will come to pass. Notice who he says is not his present heir. O oh Lord, what will you give me for I continue childless and the heir of my house is Elias of Damascus? He doesn't say the heir of my house is Lot. I mean, Lot was his own kin, his own nephew. And it appears to all intents and purposes that Lot has been, as it were, cut out of the inheritance because Lot is bringing himself and his family to the brink of disaster. And Abraham will not entrust him with this earthly inheritance. No, he has adopted one into his household, Eliezer of Damascus. That is his present heir. But for Abraham, the problem is this. No child, no land, no inheritance and no future blessing for all of his inheritance, and no spiritual blessing for him now. Because he understands ultimately that the Christ must come and deliver him from sin. It's not just about land. It's not just about children. His own salvation is tied up with him having a son. And he's waiting on God. He's asking God, will you give me something to assure me? Uh, Hebrews tells us he considered himself as good as dead in terms of having children given his age. He says, what will you give me, Lord? Was he wrong to ask this question? Are we wrong to ask God questions in times of trial and hardship? We have to say no. Even our Lord cried out on the cross, did he not? Why have you forsaken me? Our Lord, sinless and perfect, asked God a question in the midst of the most grievous of trials. And let's not forget the relationship that Abraham has with God. God has had previous 
conversations with Abraham. They have spoken together. He has heard the word of God. And Abraham doesn't come here with disrespect or a root of bitterness in his heart. No, he comes asking God, in a sense, as proof of his faith, what will you give me to assure me of your promise? It's a struggling faith, but yet at the same time, almost an expectant faith. He wants something of God. Think forward to Genesis 22, when he's asked by his own son Isaac, the son of promise, where's the lamb? Or does he say the Lord will provide? Do we not think this was formative in that declaration of faith in Genesis 22? That he asked God for something here and God provided. What of us, brethren, when we find ourselves in situations where our faith is sore tested and tried? Have we not, and we know the answer, it's a rhetorical question, have we not more evidence, more assurance of God's goodness to us than Abraham ever had? He looked forward to the Christ, saw him from a distance, a vague outline, still rejoiced to see his day and was glad, but didn't see the detail, didn't see the color of his life, didn't see all the detail we have recorded for us in the whole of Scripture. Ought then, brethren, we, not, we ought to have more confidence and more comfort than Father Abraham. We have the very record of the pivotal moment of redemptive history, the life, death, resurrection of Christ our Lord and our Savior. We have confirmed to us in the Word of God, which coincidentally is what Abraham believed. He believed the Word of God. He believed the promise of God that the Christ would come. We also believe the Word of God, do we not? But we believe the entire Word that we have been furnished with by God, our Father in heaven. Can we not see that in our moments of profound trial, those life and those death issues and moments of life, those doubts over Christ, those doubts over our own grip on Christ, whether our sins have been forgiven, can we not see in glorious technicolor what God has done for us? Abraham said, what will you give me as a sign? If we were to say this to God, what will you give me as a sign? He would answer back, have I not given you all the sign you need? Have I not given you my son? He would say, look on my son in the word. Look on the beauty of his face. Look on his graces and his character. Look upon his righteous life. Look upon his atoning death. Look upon his glorious vindication from the grave, his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the majesty on high. That's all you need. That's what you need, dear friend. Will you not give me a sign? He'll answer you, I have given you every sign that you need. Find in Christ that total, lifelong, eternal satisfaction for every need, dear friend, that you have. Whether it's salvation, whether it's sanctification, whether it's assurance, whether it's perseverance, whether it's comfort for the lonely, whatever your need presently is, you will find it in Christ and you will find it nowhere else. And God wants to meet Abraham where Abraham is, which is another good lesson for us. He promises, he answers his question affirmatively. What will you give me? God says, verse 4, he provides him with a proof, a proof of the promise. Here we see the grace of God, the fatherly kindness of God, confirming promises to a questioning son of his. What will you give me? The question is, the answer is this. This man, Eliezer, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. 
the word of God is the first proof of the promise of God. You notice that? Doesn't even give, it, give him a miraculous sign. He just comes to him again with the word and gives him the promise again. The word is the first sign of God's promise. But the second sign is this, verse 5. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. To correct Abram, to assure Abram, he takes him outside of the tent in which he dwells and points him to the heavens to number the stars. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where there's very little light pollution and it's a clear sky at night and you look up to the heavens and the number of stars is just innumerable. I remember the first time I saw that, southwest England in Dartmouth, a small coastal town. Very little light pollution. I looked up and you could see the Milky Way and it was just, it was just glorious, splendid. And God takes him outside and says, look up, try numbering those stars. So shall your descendants be. And every time Abraham walked outside of his tent, night after night after night after night after night, he would have seen those stars again and again and again. Do we not see the tender care of our Father in heaven? A doubting child immediately shown the glorious scale upon which God was thinking and planning and purposing with regard to this promise. An innumerable number of offspring. Historical Israel for a start. I don't suppose we can number them. But then the true Israel, all of God's people throughout every age, from every nation, tribe, and tongue, until our Lord comes again, true Israel, those of the household of faith, so shall your offspring be. And evidence of that promise fulfilled, look around. I know you can't turn your heads because we're Presbyterians, but... We're not allowed to do those kind of things. But you know there are people behind you and in front of you. Proof today of God's promise being fulfilled. Not just a physical lineage. Not even just the spiritual lineage of those who are of faith. Not just the many, but also we can say the one, can we not? Listen to Calvin's thoughts on this promise. Therefore, that physical seed must have a head, or we will not have the truth of this promise. Jesus Christ is set forth before us, and as we are gathered into him, into that union, it will cause us to be esteemed as Abraham's children. Consequently, there would be no seed of the kind spoken of here if Jesus Christ did not hold the sovereign position and we had not been united to him. So you see, Calvin is picking up on what the Apostle Paul will say in Galatians, telling us that in fact the physical seed and the spiritual seed of the church is not even the principal understanding of the phrase, to your offspring. Rather, it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Listen. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Very clearly, we have a, a, a Holy Spirit-inspired interpretation of what God is saying to Abraham, so shall your offspring be. Principally, the offspring of Abraham is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And as God makes covenant with Abraham, first of all, the promises in chapter 12, now here in 15, again in 17, when the covenant is confirmed with a a sign. Included in that covenant are the seed of Abraham. And principally, that seed is Christ. Not only is Christ spoken of here prophetically, as in one who is to come, but he is spoken of as one who will meet all the stipulations of the covenant and fulfill all that is necessary so that the covenant can be extended unto us. That's why Calvin calls him the head. That's why Calvin says we are united into him so we may be called children of Abraham. And the blessings of the covenant come to us because we are found in Christ. And what chief blessing is Paul thinking of in Galatians? We'll go back to chapter 2 and we'll read this in verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God, uh, before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. And then he says this in verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What is one of the chief blessings Paul has in mind? Not just the reception of the spirit, but justification by faith. The blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. And Genesis 15, 6 speaks of that blessing of Abraham. God justifies Abraham. We read this in verse 6. He believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. I'm going to be somewhat briefer on this verse, because I think in three weeks, when I'm preaching again in the morning, I'm going to come back and preach on justification by faith. But let's consider it now in the life of Abraham. He believed Yahweh, the Lord, the covenant God, it says. And this kind belief is so very important to us. It is a belief that looks outside itself for more certain realities than we can measure with our own senses. It's a faith which looks outside ourselves for more certain realities than we can measure with our own senses. Traditionally, the church has has thought of this kind of faith as comprising of three elements, knowledge, assent, and trust. And we see knowledge, assent, and trust in two peculiar ways here. First of all, who does Abraham believe? It says, Abraham believed the Lord, Yahweh. He knew of him. God had revealed himself to him. He agreed, he assented with what God had said to him. And very clearly now we are seeing a trust, a wholehearted trust in Yahweh. We might think, well, it's easy, isn't it, to trust such a benefactor like God who had made him rich even when he had sinned. But let's be honest, at this time there was a crisis point in Abraham's faith. He had no child. And everything, including his own salvation, rested upon that matter of him being childless. Everything was bound up in this promise of a seed. God shows him the stars and says, so shall your descendants be. I will give you a son of your own body. And Abraham believed the Lord. And what what did he believe? He believed the word of God. He believed the promises of God, that God would give him a land, that God would be his shield, that God would give him a seed of his own body, that God would make his name great, that in his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He believed it. He trusted God. God had proven himself faithful in the fulfillment of earlier promises, and Abraham believed him. He saw himself in great need, not just great need of these material matters, of great need of salvation from sin. 
He believed God's diagnosis of himself, and he believed God's remedy of himself. He believed on the basis of the word of God, the promise of God. Luther, in typical Luther-like fashion, says this, This is truly an instance of treating the Scriptures in an apostolic manner and of establishing the universal statement which is so dreadful and detestable to the very gates of hell that all who believe the Word of God are just, are justified. All who believe the Word of God are justified. And having believed the Lord, having believed His Word, God reckoned it to him and counted it to him, the text says, as righteousness. In Scripture, we know this as the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Clearly taught here, witnessed to in the New Testament, not least in Galatians, that we have seen earlier. The object of Abraham's faith is Yahweh and his word and his promises. Though he never lived to see the fulfillment of those promises. Do we hear that? He never lived to see the fulfillment of all the promises. Yes, he saw the son Isaac. But he didn't live to see the day of Christ in his body. He still believed. And he saw that all his promises were in fact bound up with that great seed, Jesus Christ. He wasn't, in a sense, looking for a land that was flowing with milk and honey. But he was looking for a city, a land, a new earth, where there was a river as pure as crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. He's looking for heaven itself. Christ not only is the recipient of the promises, but is the fulfiller of the promises And because Abraham sought an answer outside of himself, he also received a reward outside of himself. God counted it to him as righteousness. God credited Abraham with a righteousness which was not his own, which we know to be the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham, a man inherently sinful just like us, plucked from obscurity in Ur of the Chaldees, living under the curse, granted God's protection, and now granted the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And not just righteousness, but the removal of the stain and the punishment of his sin. Those are the two chief benefits of justification, that our sins, though they be as scarlet, are made to be as white as snow. They are removed from us as far as the east is from the west. God says he places our sins upon the ocean floor. And we are made to be righteous, reckoned to be righteous on account of Christ's righteousness how do we receive that it is simply by faith simply by faith not a single work you or i can do can earn this kind of righteousness we need to banish this kind of self-righteousness from our own thinking it needs to be removed from our lives once and for all in christ you see We are cleansed, cleansed from sin's guilt, its power, its curse, and not just cleansed, but accounted righteous with Christ's own righteousness. I mean, dear friend, surely you know what a miracle this is. When you look at your life, just the last 24 hours, and the number and scale of sin in your life, in my life, And we are before God this day no less righteous than his own son? It's a staggering truth that not one philosophy of man, not one world religion that is out there today can offer that kind of righteousness. A righteousness which comes 
from Christ. Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. If you're here today without Christ, think hard on your status. Think very hard this day, please, friend. If you're here without your sins being removed, they are still laid to your account. You will give an account for what you have done before Almighty God. And you have no righteousness, no matter how good a life you live. It matters not. Oh, we, we urge you, we plead with you to turn from your sin this day and lay hold of Christ in faith, that your sins may be forgiven, that you might be rendered righteous before Almighty God. And what, dear friend, if you have done that in life, if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, is your life a life of joy and peace? And I don't mean that that fake joy, that plastic smile, that I'm doing just fine that we put on for the world. I mean, is there a, a, a deep-rooted contentment and peace within you? Because you have not fulfilled all righteousness, but one has fulfilled all righteousness for you. That you have no fear ultimately, ultimately, because Christ feared on the cross in your stead. It is possible, you see, brethren, to flourish even in the midst of the most profound trial, even in doubting God's word and God's will for your life, as Abraham was in some small way here. When life appears to be against you at every step, oh, there's only one anchor to hold you in the storm of life, and that's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that it can be written in Scripture. He who has begun a good work in you will indeed bring it to completion. Thanks be to our God for his faithfulness to his word and promise. Let's pray. Lord, we bless and magnify you for your good kindness to us. So much mercy, so much grace, we would turn to you repeatedly, Lord God, that we, your people, might come before you privately, familiarly, and, and in this place with soft hearts ready to be instructed. Oh, Lord, instruct each one of us that we might know who we are in our Savior, and thus we might honor you in our conduct. Oh, Lord God, we cry out to you. Have mercy upon those this day that do not know you. And grant grace and strength and comfort to each one of your children. As you have shown us your faithfulness, reveal it to us again. Receive now our praise in and through Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.